Thank you. It's a pleasure, a privilege uh, being here, and uh, I appreciate you spending 30, minute, 30 minutes with, with me. Um, I was invited here uh, and offered to give more, say, personal reflections based on the global, say, global energy climate challenges and, and the role I have in the government office and, and some international fora, and I couldn't resist, resist that. My, my, I have a very privileged position, in, in an unusual position and daily, daily life. I, I, I represent Sweden in, in several international fora. And relevant for this, I, I, I think, is the International Greenhouse Gas Program, where I am the vice chair since a number of years. That program is um, a cost-shared program with a budget something like 30, 40 million Swedish kroner a year. It is um, some 40, 45 partners. Half of them are countries and half are the major energy, energy business, energy companies globally. And the, the work is related to following developing, to triggering improvement of CCS technology and to verifying how CCS uh, interacts with comp competitive with other climate, uh, climate technologies. Uh, I'm also active in the Global Bioenergy Partnership that was started by an initiative on, on the G8 summit in Glen Eagles in 2005, I think, and I'm chairing a task force there on uh, the sustainability criteria indi indicators for bioenergy, de bioenergy development, uh, supporting sustainable development. Um, I'm also representing Sweden in the... Uh, over view, uh, surveillance of the nuclear fuel market and nuclear development. And, um, and I, my, my, my basic work is often to nego negotiate new energy directives uh, in, in Brussels. So this is the background, and it's primarily CCS and, um, and, and uh, bioenergy I, I will reflect on today. Um, I think a very relevant starting point is this. This is one, just one example. It's the IEA blue map scenario. What happens if, we, if economic development continues as we have decided that it must do to fulfill the Millennium Development Goals on poverty eradication? Uh, with business as usual, without technical development and application of better technology already there, we will be completely out of, uh, out of sense in, in uh, resource uh, use uh, and, and climate, of course. So, so the, the top of this figure is um, business as usual, and the bottom is basically the global demand for uh, climate change uh, preventing dangerous interaction with, with, with the global, global climate system. And we start here with something around 30 billion tons. If we do nothing, just develop, we, we, we are rapidly going to 60, but climate requires us to reduce by 40, 50, 60 percent. And that is, that is a real challenge. It's only 40 years. Only I come back to, back to that. And uh, I think that the message for this, you, you see here uh, that the necessary message is uh, illustrated here with efficiency, efficiency, renewables, nuclear, and carbon capture. And um, if, if you look on this 6% nuclear, how much is that? 6% isn't very much. It's, it's an old-time normal interest rate. But 6% uh, nuclear here, that isn't one reactor in Finland. That, that is something like 500 reactors. That's one reactor a month for 50 billion Swedish kroner. So, 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 so that is 10, 15 billion Swedish kroner a week invested in new reactors. And that gives us a 6%. And that's very much for Sweden, but it's not very much if you divide it by 9 billion people. If they are rich, it's nothing. It's like a Big Mac. And that's the, 
if you look upon it from a Swedish uh, Ankdam, it is uh, insurmountable. If you look on, 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 on uh, uh, a clever nine billion people, it's a piece of a cake who will have their bigger pay cake, part of the cake economically. Um, what is happening now, the, the uh, IEA will very soon release their new world energy outlook. And um, I think they will be very clear with what is happening, what is assumed to happen in South Africa in a couple of weeks, uh, does not take us to two degrees and 450 parts per million. We are on a rapid way to 650 ppm, and that is not two degrees. That is much more. Um, when I looked at and selected this picture yesterday, I also had a historic reflection uh, some of you uh, might remember we had a discussion about acid rain and sulfur emissions uh, some years ago. Um, Sweden peaked with a million tons sulfur di sulfuric acid emission, and we had the highest per capita emission in Europe a couple of years in, in the late 60s. We don't talk very much about it. But it was the same, say, denial. Sulfuric acid might not be acidifying. It isn't scientifically proven that it is acidifying in the forest. It is in the lab, but not, perhaps not in the forest. And if it is acidifying, the cost of not emitting will be prohibitive. We will be out of industry and go back to living in caves, eating, uh, eating cabbage raw. That, 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 that was a little of what the industry said, uh, including part of, of the forest industry, but not the industry which will come after me here, actually, as I remember. Uh, anyway, uh, we developed sulfur cleaning. Nobody sees as, as an, it's, come, it's trivial today. It's a part, part of a plant. The co specific cost peaked at 20 kroner per kilogram, nothing. And now it's just part of, part of the technology. And not, not, no, not very many recognize the, 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 that we have sulfur policies. We, we have a discussion now on the Baltic ships, but that, that's another special issue. And, and, and I think, I, I come back to some reflection of how, how expensive this would, uh, would be, or what a challenge it is. Uh, uh, if you look at CCS here, that, that, that is pointed out for, uh, as 19% of the uh, emission reduction. That's roughly something like 10 billion tons CO2 a year. And that means 10,000 plants separating, avoiding one million ton each. And in 40 years, 10,000, that means, if I'm counting correct, that's 250 new plants a year. That is five plants a week. And with the assumed cost of these CCS plants, we, we, we are talking, say, uh, 3 billion euros a week in investment. And what is that? Is that a lot? Is it impossible? I would say it is, it's enough money to trigger many big actors to try, try to get a serious part of that market. But for a global economy, it is actually twice the Samsung company in turnover. And, and that, that is significant, but not uh, the, the end of the world if we have to, 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 to do that. The same with the nuclear 6%, that is something up to something like uh, 500 to 1,000 new reactors, depending on size. It's also possible if we want uh, nuclear. But the important thing of this figure, I think, is that um, if you look at nuclear and carbon capture, which is a little high-tech, futuristic part of this, it is pointed out here to 25%. Energy efficiency is pointed out uh, uh, with almost double that share. So the message is energy efficiency in all its diverse forms. And then you have to add as much renewable you can get, as much nuclear you might want to build, and as much CCS. And also interesting here, CCS in uh, industry is uh, pointed out as uh, almost as important in volume as CCS in baseload power 
power, uh, power plants. So it is a diversity of technology, integrates CCS in steel, pulp, cement, not only the traditional CCS thinking on a coal-fired power plant. It's a diversity of technologies and a real challenge of integrating this in an energy efficient way in all the different diversity of processes. Uh, and uh, yes, okay. Uh, I think it's consensus developed by IE that we, we change, we, we are not in the old discussion, uh, renewable or nuclear, renewable or fossil, we need all of them to fulfill the service and energy efficiency, of course, to fulfill the needs of a population of 9, 10 billion people with money. Um, and the time perspective 2050, that is a shorter time th than we have uh, done things, uh, I would say, in Sweden, in historical time. Uh, see if. Yeah, I'll come back to that. I think, as I said, this is challenging. It's necessary, probably. It's uh, not prohibitively uh, expensive it is, if it is done in an engineering way. And it's still good business opportunity for every to get a part of this uh, market. And I think the time is the crucial thing. I think costs escalate if um, initial measures are, are delayed. Done over 40 years, it is, um, seems to me, with my historic perspective, uh, not very, very dramatic. Uh, but if we, we sort of start delay, it becomes at least more costly than it need to be. Um, the time perspective here, this is the Swedish energy mix in the Swedish district heating system. And it also shows the, the, the um, development of Swedish district heating. Here, start 1970 with, with 15 terawatt hours and, and uh, leveling off around 50, between 50 and 60. Um, I think there are two things. The light blue here is oil. The dark blue is the green by biomass. Uh, you see here. Up to 1980, we had an extreme dependency of only high sulfur heavy fuel oil. And it has been a dramatic shift to biofuels. And that shift, cost-effective shift to biofuels, it was possible in Sweden and to some extent in other countries to the, due to the existence of district heating. And district heating open for, for cogeneration in, in an efficient way. But my point on time, this is the development between 70 and 2008. It can also illustrate the development in Stockholm. And if we look at the time perspective on district heating in Stockholm, we started looking upon this in the very late 1920s with political, politically appointed study committees, engineering pre-studies, and the political pre-studies went on through the th 30s and 40s for 20 years. 1950, it was decided we go for CHP and district heating. And the first plant in Hesselby was built. Then the, the, the expansion development has continued all, all the time. And it took 80 years from political decision to start evaluating the option to it is fully developed as an infrastructure and accepted all over uh, Stockholm. And these 80 years, I can see, we have always thought that we are building it rapidly and, 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 and uh, but still, the, the transfer of the global uh, challenges, we have 40 years, which is still a long year enough, but it is only half the year half the time it took from political, political guidance to um, a fully developed district heating CHP system in Stockholm. Uh, CCS is one of my, my favorites in this. The challenges and, and, and sort of fascinating engineering opportunities, I think, are, uh, are many, very diverse. The chemistry is one part. 
in, in, in the uh, post-combustion absorption of CO2, the, the, um, the absorption technology to make it efficient, energy efficient, and without, uh, without any environmental effects. There now a discussion about nitrosamines again. They were early discussed as a cancerogenic risk, but that was with food additives in the 60s, 70s. Now it comes up as a positive, uh, potential discussed uh, uh, side effect of, of amine absorption of CO2. Nitramines is also, also discussed. I think there is a diversity of challenges to um, environmental chemical sa uh, safety, uh, energy efficiency, and cost. Uh, another thing that, uh, that I, 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 I like very much is the, the vision of carbon uh, with CCS. CCS eliminating the mercury emissions for car from carbon, uh, large-scale carbon com combustion. Uh, Sweden was the first country pioneering mercury environmental research, triggered by the bird and uh, silent spring in, in, in the 60s. And uh, the research in Sweden was coordinated with uh, a colleague research in, in North America. And it is actually the research in Sweden followed up in North America that now is developing into global UN Convention on Mercury Strategy, Mercury Policy. It's also a couple of years, say 30, 40, but it was the initial pioneering uh, mercury environmental research in Sweden that has developed through the pipelines and come out <coughs> as, a, as a UN convention in a couple of years. Um, as I understand, the oxyfuel version of CCS offers the pos possibility to eliminate mercury emissions from coal combustion. And that e emission is the only remaining really big emission which is not controlled any other way, or possible to control any other way in a realistic way. And uh, coal combustion with the mercury emission, that is enough with the global or half global circulation of mercury to keep our fish uh, under, under uh, food advisory forever. But if we get control of mercury from, from coal combustion, I think there is a hope that our freshwater fish, fish can be, be released, released for unlimited consumption sometime, 100 years perhaps, but that's a short time. Um, I think on CCS, what we see now is the acceptance of storage, the political acceptance of the storage part is developing as the, the critical limiting part of it. So I think the, the very, very strong, or the very, very uh, 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 the technology for monitoring, verifying the, that, that story, the geological storage works and is safe and, and permanent. The, the technology for verifying and monitoring that is uh, challenging. It's very, very far from the power plant technology, but it is uh, critical to get CCS accepted and, and applied. Uh, the, the policy in Sweden for CCS is, is welcoming. It is explicitly uh, decided by the government in, in the energy policy bill that the Swedish government welc would welcome a demonstration plant for CCS at an industrial facility. And, uh, right now, uh, SSRB is working, a project, uh, looking into possibility to reduce CO2 fr from, from uh, blast furnaces, capturing or uh, an oxy blast furnace technology. And I think that's, that says something of the technical possibilities and challenges, opportunities. Um, Biomass. In the, in the European legislation, we have sustainability criteria for biofuels. They relate to a greenhouse gas, net greenhouse gas in a life cycle perspective, and, uh, and also to the biodiversity aspect. Uh, globally, the social and economic and, uh, sustainability aspects is also so recognized. I think water and soil 
his traditional Swedish uh, <coughs> consideration when, when you look on forestry or, or agriculture, they will also come in, in, in to this. The, 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 the bioenergy is, uh, of course, it's the cultivation, it's the machinery, but it's also the... Um, some people claim that cultivation has a limit, that the uh, global system cannot cope with too much nitrogen, due partly to the uh, losses in the con bioconversion of nitrous oxide. I don't know, but um, the, um, it is discussed at a lim as a limiting factor globally for bioenergy, how much nitrogen we can allow us to put into the system. And that is sort of a challenging research science area to, uh, to fine tune our understanding and, and to, to sort of steward, add stewardship of the nitrogen in the in cultivation, harvesting, recycling. So, so I, I think also the biomass outside the technology plant has challenges for, uh, for, for science outside the pure cultivation agricultural disciplines. Finally, I think when we, we, we look upon, upon energy efficiency together with uh, renewable energy, obviously uh, solar and wind is important. And I think as, um, as an automatic effect, the demand for a very, very smart grid is a, a, an area which will increase in, in uh, importance, be a very good market for very diverse technologies. Uh, there are countries who has this as an economic development strength, in focus for economic development strategy, that the, the smartness of uh, electricity grids is uh, essential and will be an extremely good market for, for an enormously diverse set of technologies. Thank you. Objections and questions, welcome if you have a couple of minutes. Thank you very much, Sven Lok.